In 2019, I made this cosplay. I'm calling it a cosplay for this video, but it was actually made for a fashion show where designers created fashion garments based on fandom, and this one was based on my love of Steven Universe. And I'm giving us a second here for anyone who cares about cartoon spoilers so old that they're in kindergarten to leave the chat. I worked really hard on this dress. I worked on it every day nonstop for three months. It is a drag-inspired transformation dress that goes from pink diamond into rose quartz. A few weeks later in the fall, I got this comment on my Instagram. Don't go looking for it. It has already been deleted and everyone's usernames have been changed. So this person saw my version of a rose quartz dress and thought it looked so similar to someone else's version, I'm assuming a friend of theirs, that they thought they needed to leave a comment and make sure that I knew that this wasn't okay. I had never heard of the cosplayer that they were accusing me of having copied from. And in fact, when I looked at their profile to see what similarities I could see between our two different takes on this character, the only thing I noticed is that we both interpreted the ruffled edge of Rose Quartz's skirt to be flower petals. Because her name is Rose Quartz, and, and that's in the name, so of course we made them rose petals. Not only that, but I was pretty directly pulling from the uh, House of Dior Junon skirt, which is a very famous, very beautifully made couture gown that has also been emulated in designs like Broadway's Glimpse. It is a very famously referenced dress. I was deeply insulted that someone would look at months and months of nonstop work and all-nighters and really deep personal connections that I had put into this build and think that I got the idea to put a petaled skirt on a character named Rose from someone else. And I did get very spicy in my response to this person because that's not how you build community. Two cosplayers can cosplay the same character and that is not plagiarism. That is Cosplay 101 stuff, and God, I hope if you're watching this video, you have some familiarity with the cosplay scene, but if you don't, buckle in, my dude. But that's not really the full picture of what we're talking about here, is it? When we talk about plagiarism and accusations of plagiarism, we are really talking about power dynamics. In this situation, I had between 10 and 20,000 followers on Instagram, if memory serves, and this person had less than a thousand. The friend of this person thought that I was punching down, that I was stealing ideas from a cosplayer that I didn't respect and didn't want to credit, and taking them as my own, as someone with more power in that situation. We're also, of course, talking about plagiarism. Let's just get the elephant out of the room because one of my favorite video essayists just put out a four hour essay about plagiarism and YouTube a few weeks ago. I think it was like two weeks ago. When did H Bomber guy put out that video? Hang on. Six times. December 2nd? This one on of no, no fucking way this came out on December 2nd. I mean, it's... It's January 17th? What do you mean it's January 17th? Is that... Oh my god. Hi. Um... So I leave for MAGFest in 24 hours. It's, it's 3 o'clock right now. Oh boy. I'm so sorry, you guys. I'm just gonna have to multitask on this one. The amount of stuff I have to get done before I leave to drive down to this convention is absolutely astonishing. I am, it is, it's flabbergasting. I am all the way flabbergasted over here. Full flabber, full gasted. Fuck. The power dynamics involved in James Somerton's plagiarism is exactly why I think it became such a scandal and why it captured our imagination for so long. He was actively stealing work from smaller queer and trans creators and using their words and their work to make a name for himself as a smart dude and someone that we could all look up to as a thought leader. In our current internet landscape, it's not that reach and visibility necessarily equates to financial stability or a livelihood, but they are still a certain kind of power and James absolutely had that power. As a cosplayer, it has been really interesting to firsthand live through my own experiences in the shifting power dynamics of gaining clout. And there's more I want to say about that, um, but I forgot how much music they play at the storage unit. The idea that plagiarism can't be separated from an imbalance of power and a lack of respect is one of the big takeaways for me from Harris's video. I don't know why I just called him Harris. So it's not like we're on a first name basis. So when people plagiarize, they do it because they think they can get away with it. They steal in instances where they think no one will notice or no one will care or some combination of the two. 
My number one best guy, Harris, describes details of a few examples of this even before he gets to the James Summerton main event. Like Philip, the YouTuber who copied voiceovers and video concepts from significantly smaller channels and passed it off as his own. The visibility on those other channels was way lower than his own, so the odds someone would clock the theft was really low. That was why he did it. Or when a Melania Trump speechwriter lifted huge chunks from a Michelle Obama speech, in that case people definitely noticed, but the people who were outraged by it weren't Melania Trump's audience. Her audience maybe did notice, but they didn't care about the disrespect because they already didn't respect Michelle Obama. When you steal someone's work, you are sending the message not just that you don't value them, but also that the act of devaluing them probably isn't going to have any major consequences for you. And yeah, just like everywhere else, these kinds of power imbalances drastically shape whatever f shit du jour is going down in cosplay. That's a good phrase. I, we should stick with f shit du jour. That happens a lot in the cosplay community. My personal experience is that despite the fact that for the first eight years I cosplayed, I had virtually no level of clout or influence to speak of, that is not my reality anymore. Like I switched sides. I'm in a very different tier of visibility now. And for this video, I'm gonna be focusing way more on social capital than the ability to be like financially stable in your path as a creator. But even so, being a small creator is a label that is inherently relative. Now that I'm above 100k on all of my major platforms, I feel infinitely small. Like, I looked in the Palantir and I wish that I could unsee it. The more I become aware of the larger ecosystem of YouTube and its sheer scale, the more my own stuff feels objectively microscopic. But at the same time, I know if my past self from those first eight years of cosplay could get into a time machine and hear me say that right now, they'd think I was being such a jackass. They'd be like, bro, what are you talking about? 100k is massive. Shut the f up. <laughs> Because the idea of being a big creator or a small creator is necessarily based on perspective and perception, both of these things can be true about someone while actively contradicting each other. Which is weird. And sticky. But that's a topic that deserves a lot more digging. When it comes to plagiarism at least, what matters is that there are some dizzyingly wide ranges of influence that individual cosplayers can have, and that these power dynamics are what make plagiarism matter when we talk about it with regards to cosplay. About a year ago, something happened to me that made me really realize how much my own reality in cosplay has changed. I got a notification from Instagram that someone had tagged me in a story. Um, it was a cosplayer named Sylph Stitches. They were working on a Korok cosplay, and I was like, oh, that's so cool. I also have made a Korok cosplay. I debuted it the year before last in 2022. But in the story, they were talking about how when they had been working on their idea for this Korok cosplay from Breath of the Wild, because Tears of the Kingdom wasn't out yet, they saw me working on mine, and they started to not feel as good about their cosplay. Specifically, they were worried that when they finished their cosplay and finally debuted it, people would assume that they had gotten the idea from me and copied it. Because I now have a higher level of visibility, if someone with less visibility starts to build a cosplay that's kind of similar, the assumption is that they got the idea from me, and not vice versa. There was no plagiarism in this situation. Two people had similar ideas around the same time, but even when no one is punching up or down when there's no punching at all, these power dynamics can still cause accidental harm, which is why I want to bring these up before we even get started on theft time. Sylph Stitches came up with their own Korok design, and to be honest, I am absolutely obsessed. Like, I'm a major fan of this look. I think the capelet is so cute. I think the fact that they put little cutouts on their thigh highs to symbolize like the hole in the tree trunks where you shoot the acorns with the little acorn beads is so adorable. Sure, we both have overalls in our look, but like they're a funky little forest dude. I think going for overalls with that is not at all that big a leap. And I was actually planning on making a giant spinny leaf prop. Like if you look at my earliest sketches of this look, I started to draw one, but then I was like, oh, I'll figure it out later. We'll see if I have time for that. And they actually did the damn thing. They made one and it's functional and it is so awesome to see someone complete an idea that I had and didn't see through to its execution. Cause I'm just glad that that spinny leaf exists in the world. Look at it, it's so cool. I truly love their cosplay. I think the silhouette is so cute and the details are so smart. And it sucks if even for a moment, they thought that all that hard work might not get recognized because of what I already did. I really hope that wasn't the reality for them. I hope they got their own shine because this cosplay deserves it, period. And at the end of the day, like we're both pulling from the same source material for our designs. We're both borrowing similar elements. If it's derivative of anything, it's derivative of the good people of Hyrule. Cosplay and being derivative. Hmm. I wonder if we're gonna talk about this intrinsic tension later. I wonder if I'll extrude this idea a little bit more. But I wanna back us up real quick because so far we've been talking about cosplay where there is like a level of design and interpretation, where that design and interpretation is where the crossed wires over plagiarism and stealing ideas is coming in play. But that's not all of cosplay. Sometimes you're just doing a recreation. Sometimes you're just doing like a one-to-one -one of something. Sometimes you don't wanna do a reimagined, reinterpreted version of a character. Sometimes you just 
want to be the character. So, so what do we do with that? I mean, can you, can you plagiarize with that? Seems unlikely. Must be a lot harder to do plagiarism with that. My coat got stuck on my arm. I'm free. I mean, if you're doing a cosplay that's just a straight up and down recreation of a character, I guess the only way that you could really plagiarize is if you didn't give credit to someone who did something involved in making that recreation. So just give credit. If someone took the picture that you're posting, you can give them credit with a tag. If someone made the pattern or the 3D print file that you used to make this, or if you commissioned someone for the wig or whatever part of the cosplay you did not make yourself, you just credit them with a tag. Easy peasy. Short, short section. This is generally a really good idea, but there will always be some bumps along the way, usually human error and also frankly, the impact of time. You know, when you're first debuting a new build, it is so easy to remember absolutely everyone you want to tag. You can shout out even all the shops where you got stuff. But then when you've already posted the same thing half a dozen times, when it's like a throwback, when it starts to be years and years and years later and people have changed their ads and you don't know where the store is. I'm coming up on year 15 of cosplaying, so for me, that stuff happens a lot. I mean, let's revisit an example from the beginning of this video. I did this in 2019. That'll be five years ago this summer. And I have posted this specific video at least half a dozen times over the years. Have I mentioned every single time that my girlfriend meticulously dip dyed the wigs herself and helped me out with all of the styling for the hair because I did not feel like doing the hair on this thing? No, I haven't. Do I mention that like in the 11th hour, my then roommate did me the most life-changing solid by offering to paint the shoes for me. So they went in there with like a paintbrush and turned these cheap Amazon heels into the pink fantasy we saw on the runway. No, I don't mention that every single time. Obviously those tiny omissions aren't an act of intentional malice on my part. It's just something that happens over time and with reposting something for years and years. And whether or not something like that, something that is a very genuine forgetting or something that wouldn't fit in the caption, whether that feels like plagiarism depends a lot on the circumstances. I just think you can really tell when someone is excited about a cool resource in their community, which people that make patterns and do commissions are a resource. You can tell when someone who uses those resources is excited about them and wants to share and uplift them and make sure that they stick around, when someone is genuinely trying to hype up your work and drive business to you, and when someone is trying to use a level of obfuscation to make it seem like their costume just appeared out of thin air. Some people care more about a seamless, gorgeous end product than all the hard work and all of the individual people that got them there. And I think that kind of distinction is way more intangible than just remembering to plug a shop in your description every single time. And I gotta say, having an honest mistake feel like an intentional miscrediting used to be my absolute worst fear. The fear of being one of the bad ones genuinely slowed me down for many years, and I wish that I had trusted more in the community that we all have instead of being so afraid that someone would accuse me of intentionally harming them. Like, I didn't grow on social media because I was so scared to crop a photo that my photographer friends would feel disrespected by that. I really used to just post my horrible grainy whips and be like, well, that's that, I posted it once. Why am I not blowing up? And I am not the only one with this anxiety about being one of the bad ones about turning into a cosplayer who gets a kind of reputation for not uplifting other people in their community. I know this is a common fear. I know this is why I get so many DMs from people asking if it's okay if they can cosplay a version of a design that I did or something similar to it. They saw what I was doing and they felt inspired by it. So they want to make something of their own, but they want to make sure they're doing it okay. They want to make sure they're not stepping on any toes. So can they do that? Is that a thing? One of the biggest moments in the H Bomber Guy video, Harris's video, my dear friend, is when he shows an image of one of James Somerton's scripts and he has highlighted every single part that is taken word for word from someone else. It's an astonishing image. It is a very clear visual look at the extent of James Somerton's plagiarism. But cosplay isn't like that. You can't copy and paste a physical object. There just isn't really an equivalent to reading someone else's words. James Somerton built a career convincing people that he had really good ideas. But in cosplay, ideas are almost nothing. What really counts is the work. When we make shit with our hands and our bodies, we are engaging in one of the coolest and most human things we can ever do. Crafting and sewing and building tangible things will never stop being something that I love with everything that I am. 
Like I love that in a deeply uncomplicated way. I just think it's good. Ideas don't require any commitment. You don't have to actually cut into the expensive fabric when you're having an idea. You don't have to confront the possibility that your engineering plan might not work and maybe the prop isn't going to stay up how you thought and you need to figure it out. Like those are the very real moments where you are doing the damn thing. Sure, ideas are energizing and spicy. They are important and they have a role to play, but they are nowhere near as important as actually seeing something through to its execution. There's a reason why I don't talk a lot about upcoming builds until I know how I'm going to be doing it. If I shared every cool cosplay idea I had that I never actually built, I would just be passing along like the burden of that unrealized potential onto you guys. In 2020, I knew that I really wanted to make a D&D cosplay of some kind. And somewhere along the way, I had the idea that it would be fun to do a D&D kind of cosplay in the style of an overloaded fantasy merchant, the kind you see in a lot of Zelda games. Ba -ba 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 -ba. I'm loving it. Uh, several weeks later, I made this. I knew full well I was not the first person to take a generalized idea about D&D &D and turn it into a costume. When I was researching online, I found a ton of people who had already done this in some shape or form, and I'm sure there's even more that I couldn't find. But I didn't really care. I knew that even though I had come to the idea on my own 100%, I knew I hadn't taken the idea from someone else, I was at peace with the fact that other people had already done this thing because I knew that my execution was going to be what mattered here. I knew what would make my cosplay unique was the way that I visually designed it and the way that I would actually get it wearable and functional one way or another. My brain is constantly generating new and exciting cosplay ideas and I'm not delusional enough to think that each one of those is precious and unique and singular. I do not feel any kind of way if someone cosplays the same idea as me. Also, this personal stance has really changed now that I have more visibility in the cosplay community. Like now that my work reaches somewhat more people, I just can't keep as tight a grasp on like the things that I do. I don't have as much control over them. They're out there in a wider part of the world for people to do stuff with. That's fucking entropy, baby. I don't know if that's entropy. Is that entropy? I should know this. I went to school for physics. And to be so clear, people seeing my work and being inspired by it is why I do it. Two people can have the same idea and make totally different things, and I think that's awesome. It is such an honor and a privilege to be able to share work that gets seen by people, and I just hope in my heart of hearts that I get to keep doing that because I can't think of anything better. So, you know, there you go. There are no original ideas, and we all just play in the sandbox together, and everything's great. No more nuance needed here. That's it. There is a middle step between the idea and the construction. We talked about it a bit before. It's how we turn a little forest cylinder dude into an outfit or how we get from an animation model into something that'll have depth and interest. That design phase is work. Deciding where things go and what embellishment looks balanced and what embellishment is too much is work. The very first original design I made where I was turning something not human in source material into something human for me to wear was actually a My Little Pony cosplay in 2012. I am not then and am not now still a visual artist, so I iterated by just messing around with fabric and stuff. But there are people who are visual artists who build careers on this kind of thing, who make a living by designing versions of characters and concepts for people to cosplay and create. If someone were to take one of their really intricate and thought out designs and build it in person and say, hey, I both made this and also designed it, I definitely think that would cross the line into something plagiarism-y. There are personal reasons and personal contexts to why people make these decisions. I know for me, I've made some cosplays that are very tied up in deeply intense and traumatic periods in my life where the decisions that I was making were, yes, cosplay decisions, but also decisions that felt very personal to myself and my circumstances at the time. And it would just feel really weird to see someone else recreating that when I know the process and the steps and everything that I went through in order to make this design. I also have a lot of friends that do redesigns of characters where they're specifically pulling from their heritage and their culture. And it is unequivocally and uncomplicatedly a really bad move to yoink something from someone else's culture because you like it or you think it looks cool and turn it into something for you to wear and take. Don't do that. 
And if you're the kind of person that pulls in inspiration without doing a lot of research, if you really indiscriminately pick things because they just look nice and you're excited about them, then you are at a pretty high risk of doing something ignorant and hurtful. And ignorant is a very generous reading there. Some of y'all don't deserve that. With some of y'all, it's a pattern. In his video, my good friend Harris calls it the yoink and twist. And my position here is just that there are some things that should neither be yoinked nor twisted. And the onus is on you to not f it up. The other thing that's really tricky about this area is that if we come back to our gold standard of just give credit, just make sure you tag anyone who should be credited in this, that becomes really tricky when it comes to something as subtle as design. I don't think it's possible to break down the exact influences into a laundry list of taggable search terms for any given build. I certainly feel that way about my own builds. How are we supposed to balance the good of having an external and public facing list of inspirations with the messy internal intricacies of work like that? But here's the thing, whether we're talking about, you know, your inspirations or what we were talking about before with, you know, the commissioners, the photographers, no matter what you're trying to do, these platforms don't make crediting easy. On TikTok, you literally can't even edit the description of your video if there's any mistakes in it after you upload. And Instagram really heavily decentivizes using the same text over and over again in your captions. So if you're tagging the same commissioners and the same pattern shops every single post, those posts are gonna perform less well over time. And I'm not saying this to defend making bad choices and to defend people who use that as an excuse to maybe not include credits. But it's worth mentioning, these platforms do that. These platforms actively decentivize all of the stuff that we've talked about so far that would make crediting and not plagiarizing a part of this. It's midnight, can you tell? I'm gonna get these done for sure, but the hood, I'm not sure if the hood is gonna make it. We'll see how late I leave tomorrow. It's just incredibly difficult to maintain context, especially over time. Literally the one time that I reposted that runway that we've mentioned a few times now, I was running through my checklist and I was suddenly like, oh, shit, I forgot to include that this is inspired by Steven Universe and this is for the Her Universe fashion show. And I was like, whatever, I've posted this a million times by now, it's not a big deal. And of course that was the post that has completely blown up on YouTube and gotten I don't even know how many views. And I truly hate to say this, but by accidentally omitting that context, by failing to mention in either the caption or the voiceover that this was a nerdy fashion show and that this garment was inspired by Steven Universe, I accidentally made engagement bait. I accidentally engineered a perfect social media post. There is a reason why that post blew up and it is because it didn't have the full context. And I hate that. Also, I swear some people just don't read I had a short recently get a million views and my sister has a band and I had used one of her songs in the background because I was like, it's a bop, I want people to listen to them. And I mentioned in the description of the short and in the pinned comment that, you know, where to find their band, where you can find their music. Someone replied to the pinned comment to say, hey, what's the song? They replied to the comment where I said who did the song, Jask who did the song. We're not talking about that today, but that kind of behavior makes it feel like, what is the point of even properly crediting if this is what's going to happen regardless? But even all that is literally just the tip of the iceberg of the way that social media platforms incentivize us to make cosplay worse. I really don't know if I'm going to finish this hood. We'll see. It's weird how the conversation about like, remember to credit your photographers feels almost vintage by now. Cause as we all know, at this point, Instagram hasn't been about nice photos for a really long time. Instagram, like a lot of social media is in the era of aggregate accounts, content mills, basically accounts that pull from multiple different creators across a topic or hashtag and repost all of it. These are the present day monopolies of social media. No one person can produce enough content, especially in a crafting niche, but an aggregate account sure can. I can't tell you how disappointed I am every single time I see a really cool crocheting video, and then I realize that it's just Crochet Bay 9000 or whatever. Instead of the visibility going to the person that created the content, it's going to the aggregator, to the person that curates 
and redistributes all of this content, aka stealing. And in the last 10 years or so, cosplay went from being an extremely niche hobby that frankly had a really high barrier to entry as far as skill level to something that is way more accessible. The resources that are out there are better. It is easier to learn things online now than it was back in the day. And this improved access just means that cosplay tends to move faster. The trend cycle with cosplay along with the trend cycles for everything else is getting shorter and shorter. And I find that this sped up trend cycle especially impacts cosplayers that mainly do recreations of characters. There is so much more pressure to keep up to date with whatever anime is hot this season, whatever new show is coming out that everyone's excited about, than it is for people like me that tend to do more craft-focused stuff. These short-form cosplay content creators have to really stay up to date on what the current fandom is shipping, on what characters the current fandom is really, really into. It's so much, and I, I don't envy them at all. When I first started going to cons, the fandoms or properties that people would cosplay from were Final Fantasy games that were 10 years old, or anime that had been big in the 90s. Now? Today? Tears of the Kingdom hasn't even been out for a year at this point, and I already feel like if I were to add a backpack to my Korok cosplay, I would be laughably late to the trend. And when the market is this flooded, and it has never been more flooded than it is right now, you can't produce that much output on your own based solely on your own creativity. You have to rely on trends and reusing formats. And I have something to confess here to you. Because when that four hour video about plagiarism came out, I was actually fresh off of the closest to a genuine plagiarism I had ever done in my own career. And I will tell you that story. So Halloween is always really weird for cosplayers, right? And I don't mean the Halloween aesthetic, I mean Halloween itself. The costumes that we make are generally not really conducive for Halloween activities like going out to a bar, but we also know we have the skills and we want to make something cool. So I had had the idea a few months ago, I thought it would be so funny to make a costume of the concept of carcinization. Once I had this idea, I was like, done, Halloween costume sorted, and I slapped one together in like 24 hours. My best friend was in town, he's visiting from Michigan, so like, it was a busy time. I was focused on making sure that we were having fun, that we were celebrating his 30th birthday. And when it came time to make a silly little TikTok showing people my very funny Halloween costume, I had seen like at least half a dozen joke TikToks where people were uh, making jokes about their niche Halloween costume. So I saw one that I really liked, and I was like, oh, cool. This is really similar to something I've seen a bunch of other people do. In my mind, it was very trend adjacent, so I used the same caption and audio, and I was like, oh, it's like a little trend, and I reposted the same thing. The video that I took the joke from had millions of views. So in my mind, I was like, cool. It's not gonna come for their bag if I am also using the same joke. I thought it was funny, I thought people would laugh, um, but I didn't think that much of it. And unfortunately, the video has completely blown up, especially on Instagram. I think it is the most viewed thing that I've ever posted on Instagram. And it didn't feel good. I don't know, I was very aware that I was copying someone else in the name of trends and in the name of Halloween. And also quite frankly, in the name of the fact that a Halloween reel is never actually going to mean anything big for my business. In content creation, sometimes you have videos blow up that really mean something for like your career and stability. And sometimes you have stuff blow up that is a total flash in the pan. This was 100% that kind. I got almost no followers from it, even though it's the most viral thing I've ever posted on Instagram. And I don't know, it just felt weird. Even for a one-off, I didn't like being part of the trend. I didn't like taking someone else's joke. But the thing that I really hated about that experience is it illustrated to me how much further I would go if I adopted that mindset more often. If I got in the habit of stealing jokes and stealing formats from other people, as someone who works in content creation and is trying desperately to build a sustainable career for themselves, I would just go much further and get there faster if I cut these corners more frequently than literally once in my entire career. But my crime was honestly just a drop in the bucket. When we talk about plagiarism and cosplay, part of what we're talking about is this kind of inter-community stuff. Things like similar design ideas and crediting properly, and being grounded in good intentions while acknowledging the way that the relentless churn of the context machine pushes us all to do more and do it less well. That is part of it. But let's put all that nuance in the other room for a second and talk about some real-ass plagiarism. The kind of plagiarism that is not cosplayer on cosplayer crime, but capitalism on cosplayer crime. Cosplay is no longer merely something you can do, it is also something that you can buy. 
And to be clear, I have bought cosplays before. This isn't about gatekeeping or elitism when it comes to technique. It's about being wary and critical of what happens when capitalism comes to play. And this is a problem when major cosplay retailers are known to steal images directly from other cosplayers. Cosplay retailers have been known to steal designs from other cosplayers and list them for sale. This is also more often than not those same companies that are running those aggregate accounts. Even if they aren't directly stealing designs and photos from cosplayers to falsely advertise what they're selling, they are still very much part of the problem when it comes to the sheer churn of content and the churn of the fashion industry. The cosplays that we buy are part of that. I am not saying this from the position of the moral high ground. I didn't learn how to craft my cosplays because I thought it would be more ethical. I learned because I just got started a long time ago and there weren't these resources available. Necessity is the mother of invention, or as Sasha Valor likes to say, mother is the necessity of invention. Those early limitations is what made me a lover of original designs, of being able to put my own spin on things. Cosplayers who craft are not exempt from this ethical dilemma, but for this video, I do really want to spotlight on the theft that is absolutely rampant in cosplay sales. Because there is a big difference between a company that operates in community with us and a company that treats us like a market. There is nothing stopping these companies from gobbling up the things that cosplayers make and turning this hobby into a commodity. And I want to be clear, this dividing line isn't as simple as a craftsperson-focused small business your friend started versus a company that uses mass production and factory labor. The dividing line is not just between domestic, English-speaking companies and overseas companies, usually in China. That way lies a slippery slope to stereotyping and racism when you generalize and assume that all manufacturing in China is inherently unethical. That is not accurate. That is a stereotype. Sweatshops exist in America literally right the fuck now. I am not assuming that these companies steal because they don't speak the same language as me and therefore they're bad. I think these companies steal because there are literally so many accusations of them stealing. And no, I'm not naming names today. I, I just don't have the time to tango with these guys. Just Google cosplay sales. It will be pretty easy to figure out which ones I'm talking about. In the 24 hours that I have been filming this, when I really haven't been on my phone that much, a post showed up on my Explore page of Mastiff's often viral SpongeBob picture with the link to their Instagram in the caption. Just absolute clown behavior. I'm in my last, like, hour scrambling to get shit done before my friend Nami picks me up to drive down to Maryland. And I was like, oh, I should have looked up this topic on YouTube before I started filming. Oops. But anyway, I just found two other videos about plagiarism and cosplay from other cosplayers. One was actually from my longtime mutual Kira Lee cosplay, who talks about her experience having her cosplay images of a design made by another artist stolen by a company and reproduced. Her experience is sadly pretty common. She says it had even happened to her three other times that year. If you want to hear firsthand about what it's like to have your work stolen by one of these companies, I highly suggest going to watch her video. The other video I saw as I was doing my like last double checks to make sure I hadn't forgotten anything was from Chell Bell Cosplay, who detailed two instances of plagiarism, and the second one, y'all, it really bummed me out. Sometime within the last year, I started to notice people wearing these like pastel sparkle kind of cosplays at conventions. And because I don't Genshin, it took me a while to realize that they were actually cosplaying as a Primo gem, which my understanding, I think that's like the currency of Genshin. And I was like, oh my God, that's so funny. That's such a good idea. I mean, I cosplayed a loot box from Overwatch, which is also something that you spend real world money on. So I was like, oh, that's so cool to see people doing a similar thing in Genshin as a kind of joke and a little meme. And I guess because I'm not in the fandom, I didn't know that it was someone else's idea. A cosplayer named Couch Potato Chan in 2022 handmade a beautiful painted Prima Gem costume that went very viral on TikTok. I think it got 7 million views. And it was only after she did this that companies started mass producing this idea. Not only this, they used images of her in her beautiful handmade cosplay to advertise their mass produced one. They point blank stole the idea from her completely. And now people like me see these mass produced Prima Gem costumes and have no idea that it came from someone else. That something whimsical and fun, something that's grounded in the joy we experience at a meetup when you see characters from a thing you love and you get to connect over what it's like to play this game, that got erased. It is not news that big corporations like this take advantage of small creators. You can go to my post on Instagram and see for yourself if somebody's talking about their experience of their image being stolen when they first started cosplay. I spent a lot of time and effort making this Primo Gem cosplay and as a small creator, there is no way that I can compete with this company's prices. I make everything by hand. What they are charging for the Primo Gem cosplay doesn't even cover the materials to make one of these. It feels like I'm being taken advantage of. 
negative. It's really hurting my motivation. It's making me kind of scared to talk about ideas, about cosplay ideas that I have because it feels like as soon as I put it out there, a big corporation might swoop in and claim it as their own. If you take anything from this video, please don't support those talk stores that are stealing my image and stealing my This idea. fucking sucks so bad. And I've officially run out of time to make the hood. I'm literally fucking, I just sewed a goddamn cylinder and I'm gonna have to make it work. The thing that sucks so bad is that even though this cosplay is a thousand percent stolen from this cosplayer to be sold, I'm sure the company would be like, well, but it's just a costume of the gem as it exactly appears in the game. So I bet they feel like this isn't really stealing. Because I don't know, it's like the cosplayer quote unquote stole first from the source material. I don't know, you guys. When cosplay is defined by having a source material and being based on something else, does that mean it's always derivative? In the last few years, I've noticed that the word itself, cosplaying, has kind of taken on a secondary meaning in some cases. Sometimes we use cosplay as a derogatory verb to mean the shittiest, most inauthentic knockoff of something real and genuine. Like my friends and I talk about people who cosplay as being poor when they really come from wealthy families, but they want to seem like an edgy artist type. I mean, I use the word cosplay like that sometimes. I have absolutely joked that I'm cosplaying as a video essayist in putting together all this to self-deprecate my own investment in putting together something worth watching and thinking about. So like, is that all that cosplay is? It's literally a hobby where we recreate the things that other people did. Maybe you're not taking the labor of someone else directly, but indirectly, yeah, that is what cosplay is, right? Is this whole thing just garbage? Am I wasting my life? Am I absolutely kidding myself thinking that I'm doing cool original works when really all I'm doing is a step above plagiarism? This was the spiral I was spiraling in sometime in 2022 when I was supposed to be working on a script. Instead, what I ended up doing was sitting down in the coffee shop where I came to work and just word vomiting into a Google Doc about what the fuck am I even doing here? What are any of us doing here when we cosplay? Unfortunately, I'm one of those everything is political douchebags and I knew if I was making a career for myself as a content creator and as a cosplayer specifically, I needed to make sure that that was something that was aligned with my ethics, something that was philosophically stable, something that is more than just a distraction and more than just derivative work. And as I was going on this perilous deep dive of trying to figure out what the f I was even trying to do with my life, I came across the idea of affirmative fandom versus transformative fandom. The concept of these two different complementary sides of fandom was first brought up in a Dreamwidth post in 2009 by Obsession underscore Inc. My understanding is that she originally made this post in the context of a lot of balkanization in online fandom at the time, specifically between media fans and book fans, and she wanted to put out an alternate theory. Instead of separating fandom into people that are fans of non-books, things like TV shows, etc., and people that are fans of literature, which inherently kind of has a value judgment to it, she wanted to put forth the idea that fandom instead can be separated into fandom that affirms the canon and fandom that transforms it. She puts forward this argument with a really generous grain of salt and with a very clear preamble that these are both celebrational fandom, there's a lot of joy and effort and creativity put into both of these. She writes that in affirmational fandom, the source material is restated, the author's purpose divined to the community's satisfaction, rules established on how the characters are and how the universe works, and cosplay, etc. occur. It all tends to coalesce toward a center concept. It's all about nailing down the details. She goes on to write that transformational fandom, on the other hand, is all about laying hands upon the source and twisting it to the fan's own purposes, whether that is to fix a disappointing issue, a distinct lack of Sims 2 woohoo having between two characters of course is a favorite issue to fix, or using the source material to illustrate a point or just to have a whale of a good time. It tends to spin outward into nutty chaos at the least provocation, and while there are majority opinions versus minority opinions, it's largely a democracy of taste. Everyone has their own shot at declaring what source material means and at radically reinterpreting it. From what I could read further, it seems like over the years, some parts of this original post have been really taken out of their context. For example, it seems like a lot of nerds have taken this as a creed to divide men and women into affirmative and transformative fans, which to me, we're just throwing that completely out of the window. I think that is completely not aligned with reality, and as a trans person, I have absolutely no interest in turning this into a men versus women thing. If you're the kind of person that thinks that men hang out on Reddit cataloging facts and women hang out on Tumblr writing fic, then I'm sorry, you really have to unpack some stuff in your head about how you think that trans people just don't exist. That might be a little too spicy to say this late in the video, but oops, I said it. The person who wrote this came from a fic background. And in the context of fic, affirmative versus transformative makes a lot of sense. 
Fic is inherently transformative. Fic is inherently filling in the empty spaces and looking at parts of the canon of a piece of media that you're like, I think I would like to make some changes here. But with cosplay, it's a little bit trickier. For me, I think of the part of cosplay that counts towards affirmative fandom as being the kind of cosplay where you look at a character or you watch a movie or you read a book and you just think, wow, I loved this. This meant so much to me. And because of that, I am going to realize that. I am going to physically turn that into an object. It's when the love and the interest and the passion is so great that you're like, I've just got to make something. I've got to put that on my body and become that thing. You are affirming the canon. You are affirming the source. You are saying, I think this thing is great and I want to make friends with people that also think that this is great and I just think it's cool. On the other side of the coin, when we think about transformative fandom and cosplay, to me, that is what happens when people make original designs, when people take a source material and actively turn it into something that is intentionally different from what we started with. It doesn't mean that we don't love the source material a lot, but it's just not quite as simple as wanting to affirm exactly what that source material is. And for me, what it comes down to is that I think both kinds of fandom are super important. I think both kinds of fandom happen for all of us in different spaces and different levels. I think most cosplays are some mixture of these two things, but I think it is really important to hang tight to and lean into the transformative aspect of fandoms like this. To me, the process of transforming a source material or an inspiration into something new is what I love about cosplaying. This is just what humans do. We pull inspiration from other stuff. We remix things. I mean, Shakespeare did this. Great artists outside of the Western canon did this. This is what we have always done as people. And I think transformative fandom is our best bet to hang tight to this hobby and subculture or whatever you want to call cosplay against the ravages of capitalism. This past year, the Her Universe fashion show, the place where I made that Steven Universe dress, one of the only outlets in fan culture to celebrate transformative work was sponsored by Disney. And I thought this was a really huge bummer because it meant that the designers could only cosplay from Disney properties. Regardless of how wide a swath that is, I mean, to me, that is just a signifier that Disney has a monopoly on all media. And while I understand that sponsorships are a huge part of people getting to keep doing cool artistic gigs, I mean, bitch me too. Her Universe has had sponsors in the past, but it is never before limited designers that they can only submit designs based on that sponsor's properties. To me, that pushes the work that these designers are doing into the category of marketing and promotion. I think that Her Universe should have paid their designers a stipend if they were going to ask the designers to solely promote Disney properties. I hope they don't do that this year. At time of recording, there's no news on whether there is going to be limitations on properties that people can submit from. And I really believe in Her Universe. I think the people that run it want to celebrate transformative fandom. It just sucks that this happened. The other thing with thinking about cosplay in terms of affirmative fandom and transformative fandom is that it really highlights why some cosplayers are able to make a living a little bit more easily than others. Sponsored builds, that is affirmative fandom, baby, easy. Cosplaying from a popular or upcoming series where the company that is making that content wants to enlist fans to have this show of like organic support, it's very valuable for companies right now, that's affirmative fandom. And it's way easier to get those kind of sponsorships than by doing stuff that is more niche, stuff that is less directly tied to the product that these companies are trying to market. I mean, maybe that's the real binary, you know? What is the kind of cosplay that exists within the churn of capitalism and that commodifies our interests and our loves and turns it into buy-in and a consumer base? And what is the kind of cosplay that exists in spite of that, you know? Also sidebar, when I was doing research for this video, there's not a lot of scholarship about cosplay. And I really wish that more like fandom scholars that like think about these things, I wish that they would talk more about cosplay because it seems like there's really a gap between the way that like fic culture and fandom in general gets studied and the way that cosplay gets studied. And I think it's because the written word is easier to analyze than like a jacket that I made out of vinyl. So is cosplay plagiarism? I don't fucking think so. If we look back at everything we've talked about, the power dynamics of a working costume designer and a single fan making a recreation are pretty clear. If a work is wide reaching enough to have fans who love something enough to cosplay it, that means whoever designed the costume or the character model in the vast majority of situations has more visibility than the fan doing the cosplay. There is no punching down in the situation. Also the handiwork of creating or sourcing a cosplay is work. That is the homage. What's more, the space of a convention is a space where we know people are showing their transformative stuff. There is no subterfuge involved in walking around in a cosplay at a convention. We know what you're doing. We know this is based on something else. And walking around MAGFest, I'm reminded of just how much it rocks. 
This is my absolute favorite convention, and there is a reason why I'm not doing any more filming in the hotel room, because I've gotta go do MAGFest shit in this cosplay that I literally just finished. Also, it's a winter wonderland outside. We haven't gotten snow at the Gaylord since Katsukon 2014, and I'm very excited. This year at MAGFest, I was rooming with my buddies Noor and Nami, and it was Noor's first MAGFest. They've been hearing me talk about how this con is the best place in the world for years, and they told me halfway through the weekend that I somehow still underhyped it. MAGFest to me is the absolute pinnacle of what cons can be. MAGFest is a con where the community around it isn't accidental, it's cultivated by the con organizers themselves. Like the Danny DeVito shrine started out as a joke and now it's got a designated space and signage and it's part of the charity raffle. This con's name comes from music and gaming fest, so MAGFest. And while so much has changed about this con, it still centers this. At MAGFest, there are concerts and jam pods everywhere you walk. There's a console library and TTRPG spaces and board game libraries. There's a massive arcade. There are little tournaments here. I love to watch the claw game ones. There's a whole section for indie games to show off their work. And in the last few years, they launched a makerspace where crafters can go do drop-in crafts at a con. Like you can just walk up and start crocheting or making pearl or bead art in the middle of the con day. They had a bin full of free sewing patterns. There is just so much to do here and the majority of their programming is 24 hours. MAGFest also started piloting the Mag Scouts program where they offer programming for kids. I used to think of MAGFest as the party con and it makes my heart feel things that like even the party con is getting old and wants to make sure there's some options for the kiddos. Don't get me wrong, MAG is still a party con. There's still after midnight Beyblade tournaments, if you know where to go. I was saying to my roommates at one point that MAGFest kind of captures the feeling that a good renaissance fair has, like you could just stumble upon something magical at any given moment, something really special and ephemeral that you were lucky to encounter. Except with Ren Fairs, there's necessarily a little bit of performance and playing pretend. And with MAGFest, it's all real. Some years you catch the shrimp parade, some years you miss it. As more and more cons tie themselves up in big name guests and exclusive media releases and boots that are like IRL walk-in immersive commercials I'm f***ing dunking on you, NYCC. It means so much to me that MAGFest continues to expand in a direction that doesn't center the media we're basing our stuff on, but centers the mind-blowing breadth of creativity that our community can have. And f***ing rant, I just have a lot of feelings about it. When it comes down to it, what I think I can really extrude from the example of MAGFest when I think about plagiarism with regards to cosplay is that cosplay really benefits from being a community where there's a lot of mutual inspiration and sharing of skills. And at its center, an appreciation for the handcraft of what we do and the transformative nature of what we do. Those are the pillars to me. But the mutual inspiration and the sharing of skills only works when we approach cosplay like it is a community, like a rising tide that can lift all boats. Social media incentivizes competition, it incentivizes output, and this whole hobby being a zero-sum game. It pushes productivity and rewards cutting corners. It makes it so that everyone is a singular creator and not part of a collective group. I have seen accusations of plagiarism in cosplay that are completely detached from reality, that are nothing but useless drama mongering and someone else's victim complex, that are in desperate need of someone knocking on your door and saying, girl, you know that's not it. I've also seen genuine plagiarism push people out of cosplaying. I've seen people leave this part of their life behind because of genuine actual plagiarism that has happened to them. The point of this video isn't to litigate every single thought experiment that could happen or pass judgment on every conceivable example of plagiarism that could possibly ever exist. The point is to highlight that it's up to us as a group to work through this stuff when it comes up. We have got to handle the intercommunity stuff with empathy and love, and we've got to hold a strong fucking line against the external forces that seek to commodify what we do. How do people end video essays? How do you do this? Thank you for watching this. I know I had some audio issues at the top. They were completely my fault, um, and thank you for sticking through it. This video would not exist without my patrons. I cannot say thank you enough to them. They are the reason why I'm able to focus on these weird long form things. I don't even know if there's an audience for this video. I really hope that people like overthinking rambly video essays about the nature of what cosplay is and what, uh, you know, you just watch the whole thing. And I wanna give a special thank you to Molly Doyle, Joe Burrito, Turson, Maggie Holden, Lauren Rogers, Arden Winner, KFry84, and Eli. I wanna give a special thank you to Hust, 
to Stephanie C, and of course to Toria Toria Toria. If you like listening to me talk for long periods of time, I recently started doing exclusive monthly update videos on Patreon, so every month I will post just to kind of update on where I'm at, what's happening, and that's really cool because most of the time my crafting happens well in advance of when I post it publicly, so it's kind of a chance to have some extra videos for like chatting and hanging out um, to show you what I have been katsu crunching on. If you want to see where that project is at currently, Patreon is, is the spot to do so. I can't believe my battery just died. It was like, bro, you need to unpack now. And if you liked this video, last year I made the video that I've put the single most amount of effort into about Katsukon, which is like Magfest's evil fucking twin. It is the opposite of everything that I just said about Magfest, and I put so much work into like basically making a documentary about the history of Katsukon, but with all of my biases and commentary. I literally don't even like Katsukon, but I absolutely love that video so much. That's the real conclusion of this video is don't go to Katsukon. I mean, I'm going to Katsukon, but um, come to MAGFest. I'll see you there next year. Bye.